Hello, my name is Dr. Hank Willenbrink. Welcome to Intro to Drama. This is your lecture for day one. Today, we are going to be talking about and introducing the concept of drama. And then uh, we're going to be talking about the first play that we're going to read, um, which is a play from the early part of the 20th century, Trifles by Susan Glassbell. So our goals today are three. First of all is to define drama as a literary form, to secondly think about how plays work, and then to introduce trifles and Susan Glassbell, so that after this lecture you can go and read the play and answer some of the discussion questions that I've uh, put up for you to answer. So let's start by introducing drama. The first thing is that drama is one of the oldest literary forms. It comes from the ancient Greek word, which means drawn, which, uh, drawn, excuse me, which means to do or to act. We credit the ancient Greeks with inventing drama, and we'll talk more about them um, uh, in the next class. So when we think about drama, though, in this perspective, we're going to think about it as a literary perspective, as one of the major genres of literature alongside fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. But one of the key differences between drama and these other literary forms is that it's written to be performed, unless it's what you call a closet drama, which is a type of drama that's meant to be read, usually in this case recited, not performed, put up on stage. So there are some kind of unique characteristics of drama that the other genres don't have. So the first thing is that what we'll be reading are play scripts. Now, scripts are not uh, a production as a whole. And so a useful way to think about a play script is to and its relationship to a performance, how that play script is performed, is to think about the play as being a blueprint for a theatrical production, or you might even think about a musical score. If you, uh, if you happen to be a musician of some kind and you can read music, you might know that when you get a musical score, you might take and kind of riff on different things or have a different interpretation, that sort of thing. So really think about the play script as that kind of original um, part of a play and then a production as an interpretation on top of that. That play script is created by a playwright. This playwright is the original artist of the theater. He, she, or they make that thing which will be interpreted by the other parts of the production's artistic staff, actors, directors, designers, etc. We spell playwright in this kind of funky way with the W-R-I-G-H-T because it connotes the crafting of an object, not unlike a shipwright or wheelwright. It has a kind of medieval connotation to it. So while a script um, carries embedded meanings, there are other lived, difficult, if not impossible, to keep parts performance that are just as meaningful as a script. If you've been to see a musical, for example, when someone sings a beautiful song, you might feel the kind of hairs on the back of your neck stand up, or you might be kind of moved to laugh or moved to tears in a particular moment in a production. It's hard to capture those things. That's one of the beauties of theater is that it's ephemeral. It's a kind of... Um, goes away as soon as it as soon as it comes and so um uh, one of the um uh, excuse me a uh, a scholar who thinks about this a lot and has a really good nice distinction about this is this wonderful scholar diana taylor who talks about that there are certain parts of a performance that can be kept this is the archive you can think about this as a play script or as a um a recording of a performance um and then you might have the repertoire that's the lived part of the performance so we will be focusing in this class mostly on the play scripts, although you will watch a performance as well as we move along. Um, but I want you to kind of keep this in mind, that when we're reading a play, we're reading something that's meant to be performed. And yet, at the same time, it's something that contains within it um, important literary elements, which make it worthy of study, just like poetry or prose. But let's talk a little bit more about performance, because that is the thing that these play scripts are being read to do. Performance we can define as any activity that's aimed at a response. We are constant and adept performers who know how to play and diff uh, to different audiences. So right now, uh, as you can see, I'm in my office. I'm surrounded 
by all these different books, which gives me the air of, of appearing intelligent. I'll wait for the end of the class for you to tell me if you think I am or not. Um, I also am wearing, you know, a collared shirt, that kind of thing, which denotes a kind of professionalism. Um, so we are always kind of aware of the audiences that we're talking to, how we're talking to them, and trying to and using this uh, these performances to create our our identities and also express ourselves. So theater falls under one type of this kind of performance, these sorts of performances wearing a collared shirt, uh, maybe um, acting in a kind of more professional way. These are kinds of performances that we call everyday performance. But theater is a kind of special performance. It's a cultural performance. And the way that differentiates itself from other types of performances, say a movie or going to go see a concert, is how it's framed, how we, how the art form itself uh, presents itself and how that presentation of itself um, makes the audience understand it. Now, one of the key elements of this frame is this idea that's called the willing suspension of disbelief. This is an act of poetic faith. It was articulated by the um, English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And the idea behind the willing suspension of disbelief is that you begin, um, that you agree consciously, um, uh, consciously or unconsciously, usually unconsciously, to believe that whatever you're going to see in that particular production is true for the duration of the production. So um, you are going to uh, believe that witches can fly if you go and see something like Wicked, or that a person is actually a lion if you go see something like The Lion King. Sorry, I have a young child, so that's what I think about most of the times. Um, so this is this kind of um, thing that we enter into imaginatively, automatically in theater. Another part, important part of the theatrical frame is that there's usually some sort of stage, some sort of kind of demarcation, whether that's a raised platform or something else, that differentiates between the people who are coming to see a play and the people who are acting in a play. The people who are acting our play, actors portray characters in a live fashion through their presence. You may have had the um, the uh, experience of being taken by a family member or friend to go see them or another friend in a performance and having that kind of um, moment of uncanniness where you kind of see the person and the character that, as the same time, right? That's something that's unique to theater. Um, in general, also, you have a live audience who responds to a play in real time, right? You can't pause a play and kind of leave and go do something else. It's not uh, a streaming service, but that all of these things are happening um, in live time and that it contains theatrical elements, costumes, lighting, a different kind of setting, those sorts of things. So all of this is part of the frame. Again, how the theatrical event separates itself from the world that you generally live in. Okay, so um, one of the things I'm also going to ask you to read today is an essay by Michael Bigelow Dixon called How to Read a Play. And this will be one of your discussions that I'd like for you to post about. It's got about 30 different ways that one might read a play. And I want you to think about for this discussion, I want you to think about what your default way of reading is is. When you have encountered dramatic literature before in other classes, how are you asked to look at plays? Um, if you have um, uh, if you uh, have studied um, how to write plays or how to uh, or taken um, an acting class or that sort of thing, how has that influenced how you've read a play? What's your default way of reading and which of the ones, the types of reading that Michael Bigelow Dixon lays out, are you the most drawn to? Again, because plays are meant to be uh, performed, we tend to not think of them as much as something that exists just to be read. But reading as a plays, as we'll see throughout this course, is an incredibly important skill and something that we'll continue to develop. Okay. So when you actually pick up the script for trifles, I want to talk to you a little bit about some different elements of that. So one of the first things that you're going to see is that there are really two different literary elements to play scripts. First, dialogue, that's what characters say. And second are stage directions. So in dialogue, when you're reading, pay attention not only to the diction or the how or the word choice that a character makes, but also to punctuation. 
If you um, have, I'm sure at some point in your life, you've studied Shakespeare and you probably spent some time talking about am, iambic pentameter and that sort of thing. So you know right away that when you're dealing with poetic verse, punctuation is there to help guide the rhythm and delivery of a line. As we move throughout this course, we move closer and closer and closer to our present era. You might see as well some things like slashes. Slashes are used to indicate when dialogue might over overlap. You might see a punctuation like a dash at the end of a line. That means that an actor is being cut off in what they are saying. Or you might see an ellipse, which means that they trail off. All this to say is that when we're looking at dialogue and how a playwright is writing dialogue, what they're going to be writing is the rhythm and also the meaning that's behind it. We'll be talking later on about something that's called subtext, which is the idea that when we say something, um, what we say is not actually everything that we mean, that there's meanings that are underneath the line. But we'll get to that later on. The second element is called stage directions. These, this is what the audience sees, hears, experiences. Oftentimes, it'll include production elements like scenic and lighting, uh, lighting design elements. Um, a kind of subsection of this is what, uh, what are called acting stage directions. These are oftentimes next to a line of dialogue and indicate how a playwright would like a line to be delivered. So they're usually kind of tied to dialogue. The other thing that you might see, and especially as, again, as we kind of move forward, are um, stage directions like beat. We can think about this almost like a musical beat, a kind of short pause or a change in action, pause or silence. So these are, again, type... Um, things where a playwright is using a stage direction in order to um, in order to kind of create space within the script for things to happen. All right. So once again, scripts are unique. They're written performance, written for performance. So not unlike a blueprint or a musical score, they contain literary elements. And this is the last thing that I want you to kind of think about throughout this course. They are mimetic which means imitative, which means that they, in a certain sense, have a kind of uncanny resemblance to real life. But yet this mimesis, this mimetic thing is also metaphorical. I'm sure you've heard the at some point the idea or the phrase, all the world's a stage. That kind of gets to this idea that when we watch things in theater, what we're seeing is not only someone pretending to be someone else or a kind of world that's different from ours, but in that moment of seeing that person pretend to be something else, even if it's your cousin who's directed you to go see them in a particular play, or as you experience that world that should that's like something else, we're thinking about our world as well and thinking about our experience as well. And in this sense, theater becomes metaphorical. It takes on a symbolic meaning. All right. With that now, let's move on to the play script that you'll be reading today, Trifles by Susan Glasspell. As we move along, one of the things that you'll see that I'll do is I'll, I will kind of prompt you um, in these short lectures to think about and go into a script with a particular set of questions and then to ask you to respond to those questions at the end of the day. Part of that will be introducing you to the playwright and part of that will be introducing you to some of the elements of the script. Susan Glassbell, as I mentioned before, in Trifles, comes from the early part of the 20th century. She's got a really amazing life. She's born in 1882, dies in 1948, born in Iowa, attends uh, Drake University. If you can imagine a woman in the kind of early 1900s, this is before women have the right to vote, being able to graduate as a journalist. And she also begins working as a creative writer and as a novelist. Um, she becomes involved with another writer named George Graham Cook and a, a very famous American writer, some say the greatest American playwright, Eugene O'Neill. And with Cook and O'Neill, uh, Glassbell is one of the people who founds the Provincetown Players, which is probably the most influential U.S. theater group of the early 20th, early 20th century. And Trifles, that you're going to read today, uh, is written for the Provincetown Players to be included in a night of one acts with Eugene O'Neill's plays. Trifles is from 1916. If you like this kind of course, uh, I teach a, a literature course that's called American Drama 1916 and 1968. Trifles is the reason that we start at 1916. It's one of the great plays. Um, it's, it's almost in a certain sense, the beginning of American drama as an important uh, literary form. Here's the kind of setup that you're going to see. Um, two men 
Henry Peters and Lewis Hale arrive at the abandoned farmhouse of a farmer named John Wright um, after John Wright has been found to be murdered. So we see Peters and Hale, who are um, kind of detectives in this. There's also a county attorney. And Peters and Hale are accompanied by their wives, Mrs. Peters and Mrs. Hale. Now, as you'll see, this play in a certain sense is a kind of a whodunit. You can think about it uh, along something like Knives Out or Glass Onion, if you've seen those movies. The goal of the play what uh, Peters, Mr. Peters and Mr. Hale are there to do is to find out who the killer is, who's the killer of John Wright. But Glassbell doesn't have us follow the men who um, go upstairs in the farmhouse. Instead, we stay with their wives, with these women, and we watch what the wives do and how they're interacting with what's going on in this room. So the first one of the first questions you have like for you to post on two of these four questions is um, why do you think that is? Why do you think that Glassbell decides to focus on these two women as opposed to the quote unquote actual detectives of the play? As I mentioned a little bit earlier, plays have strong literary elements. What's a symbol that stood out for you while you were reading the play? In other words, what's something that happens in the play that feels like it has more meaning or more weight than something um, than just being a kind of element of the plot or the story of the play? Also, as I mentioned, the men are there to um, uh, to find out who killed John Wright. So there's a, what we call an offstage character, a character who doesn't appear. And oftentimes what we see are that characters who are offstage are more compelling than the characters who are on stage. They're more interesting than the characters who are on stage. How do how does John Wright, how does his wife, um, who's also another offstage character, how do these offstage characters actually define what happens in the play? How is it that they exert an influence on what's going on in the play? And then finally, going to that part about reading the um, essay by Michael Bigelow Dixon, how did that influence how you read the play. All right, that's the lecture for day one. I hope you really enjoy Trifles. It's one of the shorter plays that we're going to read, which is why we start off on, a, on day one, I, though I'm asking you to read the essay as well. I hope you enjoy it. And I look forward to reading your responses in the discussion section. Okay. <laughs>